Yeah, so as you said, Carly, variations in these um, moon halos uh, happen, and it can vary both in size and the way in which they appear in the sky outside of that 22 degree uh, norm that we expect from a moon halo. And many such variations were actually known to Indigenous people, and so we'll explore some of those ideas now. Perfect. So the Aboriginal people of Western New South Wales, they had a really cool uh, technique where they would analyse the size of the halo, as you were saying. Uh, and they, from that, they could determine how much rain is potentially approaching. So let's look at this. If the halo is large, uh, large amounts of rain uh, can be expected, while a smaller 22 degree halo, as we were talking about before, that's a much more normal um, halo and therefore smaller or more normal amounts of rain can be expected. So how does this work? So this is because uh, larger ice crystals can be formed if there is enough water saturation in the atmosphere. So what does that mean? Basically, if we have a lot of water in the atmosphere, these ice crystals, their molecular structure takes on a slightly different form uh, and then that produces a much larger halo. And we call this one uh, the 46 degree halo. It's a much wider, um, larger ring around the moon. And so from that, uh, the people, the Aboriginal people of Western New South Wales, they were able to pick up this pattern where they noticed a larger halo uh, meant more rain. And that makes a lot of sense considering uh, the atmosphere needs this extra amount of water saturation in order to be able to produce that larger halo. So the Torres Strait Islander peoples also had some very clever techniques of being able to analyze the moon halos uh, and make some more precise weather predictions. So this is a painting, this is from uh, Badu Island from a Torres Strait Islander artist called Dennis Nona. This is called Kabua, uh, Halo Around the Moon. And this, uh, this painting along with um, the, the artist and Anona, he talks about how uh, different conditions can help you determine uh, what the weather's doing and what's happening up in the atmosphere. So one example is the wind. So you could pay attention to what the wind is doing at the same time that a moon halo appears. If it's very windy, then it's safe to assume that rain is probably pretty close. It's, it's pretty much at your doorstep. However, if there's no wind, if it's a very still, calm night, you might not even get rain. The rain could be very far away and might not even reach you. There's another aspect uh, of the moon that they analyze as well, and that is the color of the moon. So if the moon is really clear, really bright, again, rain might not be approaching. You might be safe. However, if the moon is not clear, uh, if it's not very bright, say it's, you know, uh, there's something covering it like a cloud um, or, you know, anything that could be dampening the brightness of the moon. Uh, that is a really good sign that the rain is probably quite close uh, and there might be a lot of rain as well. Yeah, so from these stories then we can see that if we combine the Indigenous people's ways of, of looking at the sky and, and, and looking at country, uh, with what we now understand in Western science with atmospheric physics and optical physics and all of those sort of ideas, we can now begin to understand the very sort of practical and sort of contextually significant knowledge that's actually contained within Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge systems.